Hello there and welcome to this special video where I will introduce you to Graviting Tactics. I want to answer three questions today. What is Graviting Tactics? Is it the best World War II strategy game out there? And do I recommend it? I can already give you a partial answer to the first and third question. This game, no, this simulation, is one of the most challenging and also most rewarding and amazing experiences of fighting on the Eastern Front in World War II that is available to play to this date. It is incredibly good and if you take the time to learn how to play it, trust me it will absolutely sink its hooks into you and it won't let go. It is no surprise that this game has very positive reviews on Steam and the few negative reviews that are there are of those people who did not have the time or the will to learn how to play this game or who didn't know what they were getting into and that this is not a classical strategy game. Now some of you might immediately say, I don't like strategy games, this is not for me. Hold on, don't turn off the video. Because this is not a classical strategy game as you know it or as you understand it. This is something completely different and you will understand why later on in the video. The developers described this as a tactical battalion level combat simulation and I have to agree with that assessment. This is in essence a World War II battlefield simulator. Those of you who follow my channel might already know the developer Gravity. They are the same guys who have made Steel Fury, the same guys who have made Steel Armor Blaze of War. These guys that specialized in um, tank simulations at some point decided, hey let's make a battlefield simulator. And it's absolutely awesome and incredible what they have done. When you look at the credits for this game, you will find a surprisingly low amount of people have worked on this. And that is absolutely astonishing when you consider the level of detail and the sheer amount of work and research that must have gone into this. They started this amazing series with Achtung Panzer in 2010 followed up by Operation Star in 2014. 2016 they released Mius Front and one year later they released Tank Warfare Tunisia. Mius Front and Tank Warfare Tunisia run on basically the same version of the engine, they just focus on different scenarios. One thing that makes this game so unique is the interesting blend of turn-based and real-time strategy. There is an operational mode, you could call it a strategic layer. On that you move your forces around, you get them into position, you set up attacks and defenses, you replenish ammunition, you reorganize and reinforce your forces, you repair vehicles, and then once the battles start, that happens in real time on a 3D battlefield. Another thing that makes these games so unique is that you are playing and maybe recreating historical battles as they happened in real life you will discover that these developers really know their history. There is a very high historical accuracy with the units involved in those battles and with the locations. Actually, the battlefields are recreated by using satellite data and World War II reconnaissance photography. And it shows the battlefields have such an organic and realistic feel to them. It's incredible. The base game comes with two maps that are at the Mius River and the Sawa Mogila Tumulus, with over 140 square kilometers of battlefield for you to enjoy. The game also comes with three campaigns that you can play both as the Soviets and the Germans. And since Graviteam attempts to recreate those battles as accurately as possible, you will also have access to the units that fought there. So on top of all the infantry, you will see over 100 vehicles, guns, aircraft from German, Soviet, British and American production. And all of that is just a base game. I am somebody who really doesn't like DLCs because, let's be honest here, most of the games out there, their DLCs are including stuff that should have been in the game from the start pointless cosmetics or other pointless things that nobody asked for and that you are somehow forced to pay for if you want to have the complete experience. But even I have to admit that Gravity Team so far has done a really good job with the DLCs they have released. And I'll tell you why. You bought Gravity Team 
tactics Mio's front, okay? And you're playing the main campaign. For whatever reason, you decide to go out there and to buy all the DLCs for the game. Will this change the campaign you are playing right now in any way, shape or form? No, it won't. What these DLCs get you? Well, each DLC will give you at least one historical battle that you can play. Some even give you more than one. And you can play these battles from both sides usually. Each DLC will also give you the historical units that were present there and the battlefield that the battle was fought on. Okay, so these DLCs, you can view them more as expansions. Play the main game. If you have liked the main game, then go ahead and buy one of the DLCs if you want to have more. Play that. After you have finished this campaign, go and buy the next DLC and so forth and so forth. Don't go and buy them all at once. There's no benefit to that. But trust me, you will own them all eventually. Because once this game has hooked you, there's no way back and there's nothing comparable. So believe me, you'll get them all eventually. But one advice for me, um, there are frequent sales on Steam and you can get these DLCs with a quite nice discount. So you might want to wait for that. Most DLCs in Mio's Front will focus on Eastern Front Warfare from 1941 to 43, and most of those somewhere in the area of Kharkov. There are also a few DLCs that focus on more modern conflicts. For example, there's one that is focusing on the Tielkety incidents, a border clash between the Soviet Union and China. And then there are also a few DLCs about the South African border war with Angola in 1987. Apparently the developers are also going to release a DLC that focuses on the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. Now before I continue talking about the gameplay and about the realism, let me talk briefly about the graphics of the game. Now they are absolutely beautiful. You will see that the vehicles are modeled in very nice detail. The effects of the game, smoke, fire, explosions, it all looks very, very good, especially for a strategy game. So don't worry that the game was released in 2016, it's not looking dated at all, and it actually looks amazing. Once you have a huge battle going on and there's tracers and explosions and all that stuff around you, you will just sit there and marvel at these battlefield vistas that are recreated before you. Sometimes the images can even be disturbing, with people thrown around by explosions or running around on fire. This game really aims to show you how horrible World War II could be. There's also a lot of attention to little details. For example, when guns fire repeatedly at the same position, then the muzzle blast will slowly destroy the grass in front of the gun. When tanks fire, the gases that build up inside the tank, the smoke, it will slowly escape through um, hatches, through little vision ports and ventilation openings. Nighttime battles are a special joy to watch because of all the tracers flying around, the flares being dropped from the sky or being shot up by flare pistols illuminating the landscape in a very harsh light. What also looks amazing is the dust and smoke effects. If vehicles drive down roads or across fields where the soil is very dry, they will kick up huge plumes of dust behind them. When guns fire, they will kick up dust. Explosions, of course, will... Uh, throw huge amounts of dust into the air and all of that will reduce visibility. And then of course, if you're fighting in a snowy environment, maybe you have a snowstorm or maybe it's just raining or something like that, that will all help to create a really believable battlefield atmosphere. And there we come to the weather. This game actually has the historical weather that was present during the battles in real life. So. You might have to fight in a snowstorm, or in really terrible rainy weather, or in the scorching summer heat. And all of that will actually affect the performance of your troops. I will come to that a bit later, but this game has some amazing ballistic modeling. And it even takes into account the ambient temperature. So what that means is, in cold temperature, the initial muzzle velocity of your shells fired by the guns will be decreased just by the air temperature and the change in air pressure that that entails. Mud and especially deep snow will fatigue your infantry much faster and vehicles might get bogged down when they try to cross that ground. 
The game also features a realistic real-time day and night cycle. What that means is, if a battle for example starts at 4 o'clock in the morning, by the time you have finished the battle, the sun might have risen over the horizon. And what started out as a battle in total darkness, will have changed drastically. The weather can change as well during battles, so the morning mist that will reduce visibility for your units might lift during the battle and allow air support to come in. This game's engine also features terrain deformation. So, explosions, artillery shells landing, bombs landing, tanks firing, whatever, they will actually create craters in the ground, and infantry can make use of those craters and hide in them. Infantry can also dig trenches and set up positions in them. Vehicles and heavy weapons can be dug in as well. And now we come to one of the most amazing features of this game that is not immediately apparent to a new player. If you are playing a campaign in this game, then the state that you leave the battlefield in, all the explosions, all the craters, all the trenches dug, the buildings destroyed and set on fire, the wrecked tanks, the dead bodies, they will all be there at the end of a tactical battle. And they will still be there when you fight the next tactical battle in that area. So by the time you've finished the campaign, the village that you might have been fighting over, that looked so pristine and peaceful in the beginning, might have been reduced to a burning hellscape, crisscrossed by trenches, dead bodies lying everywhere, burnt out vehicles, their wrecks standing between the shattered and burning remains of buildings. So let's continue with something more cheerful. Gameplay. Now, as in any strategy game, you can give movement orders to your units. However, in this game, you give movement orders via a, a command wheel, you can call it. That command wheel contains a bunch of different orders that you can give, like move, attack, assault, defend, etc. etc. But the interesting thing here is that these orders are basically something like presets. You can open them up, go deeper into them, and you can select all kinds of modifiers. You can select in which formation your units should move, if they should move fast or maybe cautiously, if they should move along a route that is not easily seen by the enemy. Or for example, the attack order has um, a modifier that the infantry will throw smoke charges in front of them while they advance. You can turn that off if you wish. Just stuff like that, that really makes it interesting. What you do not have, though, is you cannot, for example, as you are used to in strategy games, right-click on an enemy unit, and that's the unit your uh, infantry or your vehicles will attack. It does not work that way. You see, the AI in this game is basically smart, and they have their own free will to some extent. So they will attack what they see and what they perceive as a threat. And you just have to work with that. They are, like humans, a little bit unpredictable at times. But that's another thing that makes this game really, really interesting. However, for new players, people who have never played a Gravity Tactics game before, this can lead to some frustration born out of misunderstanding. If you do not understand what the game is doing, then things can become frustrating. However, the game gives you plenty of tools and helpers to visualize what is going on, which unit is being targeted by your unit right now, and also what your unit can see. And if you use those helpers and those visualizations, then you will understand what is happening. You gotta be aware that they are there and that they can be used. The in-game tutorials do a decent job of explaining those things. They could be better though. So maybe if you want to get into this game, do watch a few tutorial videos on YouTube. And I'll certainly make some tutorial videos at some point for this game. Because I understand it is very complex. It can be extremely overwhelming to a new player because this is not, and I have to repeat that again, this is not 
a strategy game as you know it. It plays very differently from any kind of strategy game that you have seen out there. You just have to give it a chance, learn the basics, and then just learn as you're going. And it will be so, so, so rewarding once you figure out things. Trust me on that. Vision is in fact a very complex topic that leads to a lot of confusion for new players. Because you see every soldier in this game, every infantryman, every crewman, but they all have their own field of vision. And a common complaint is sometimes, why are my soldiers not engaging that enemy over there? It looks like they should be able to see him. But that's where many people are wrong though. This game incentivizes you to sometimes zoom in, get to the ground level and try to see the battle from the perspective of your forces. Because if you do that, you might see that what looked like a more or less clear uh, field of fire for your soldiers is in fact an area filled with little bushes or something like that that completely block their vision. So of course they can't engage the enemy, it's obvious. The same with vehicles. A tank might not see another tank because that other tank is in the blind spot of the crew. German tanks usually have this uh, commander cupola on the top where the commander can take a look into all possible directions. Soviet vehicles often don't have that. They have uh, quite big blind spots. And there is a visual helper in the game that lets you uh, visualize where your crew is looking now. Also do keep in mind that sides uh, of the vehicle can be damaged by fire. And if the sides are damaged or broken, then of course your people can't see anything through them anymore. So just be aware of that. That's just another example of things that you need to keep in mind when playing this. If something doesn't seem to work, then there's usually an extremely good reason for that. You just have to figure it out. And the game gives you all the tools that you need to do that. Another thing that influences gameplay a lot is the statistics of your units. For example, infantry. They have a fatigue statistic. How tired are they? If you let them run everywhere, they will be tired faster. And tired soldiers do not fight well. So you are incentivized to let them rest from time to time, to maybe not let them run everywhere, but instead let them walk. That's an option. Or you can do something that's really smart. If you want to send infantry somewhere together with vehicles and the area is safe, or as safe as a battlefield can be, you can let the infantry ride on top of the vehicle. That works with tanks, that works with trucks, and it's a really nice looking thing as well. It's really awesome looking. You can do the same with, for example, AT guns. If you have trucks or if you have half tracks, you can let the crew of the AT gun ride in the vehicle and the gun can be attached to the back. And so they can redeploy faster. Ammunition is another big concern of every battlefield commander. Your troops will expand ammunition if they fight, that's just natural. And that ammunition can be replenished between the tactical battles on the operational map if supply units are in range. Supply is actually modeled in this game, so even chains of supply. Everything is there and your units can be resupplied. If they cannot be resupplied in a sufficient uh, manner, then your units can even pick up enemy weapons from um, captured or killed enemies and then use those. However, that will slightly impact their skills and their accuracy. And while we are on the topic of expanding ammunition, the infantry units and vehicle units, all the units on the battlefield, they also have the statistics for um, their morale. If you suppress an enemy unit, their morale will drop, they will um, keep their heads down, they will maybe even panic, start running, or just be frozen with fear. And this is where you can then go ahead 
maneuver and attack. And that's actually a very important thing to do. If you are going for an assault somewhere, make sure that the enemy is properly suppressed first. That will reduce your casualties. Just a small tip for me. Let me mention a few more things that make this game so amazingly unique. I think I did mention already that this game has an insane attention to detail. But hear me out, what game does the following? Vehicle crews, tank crews for example. They can in fact open the hatch on the tank, on top of the tank, and throw out hand grenades at enemy infantry nearby. What other game models something like this? Because that is something that they did do in real life to defend the tank against nearby infantry. They opened the hatch, they threw out grenades. And in this game this is actually modeled and it works. You can drive a tank along a trench and uh, the tank crew will chug out grenades at the infantry. It's amazing. It really is. And then the weapon modeling in this game, the ballistics, it's absolutely incredible. I did mention that earlier, but the ballistics in this game are second to none when it comes to strategy games. You can see it when you use AT guns, when you use tanks especially. The shells, their muzzle velocity, the velocity with which they fly across the battlefield, all that is modeled in astonishing detail, and not only that, it goes even further. This strategy game has the best, most complex and realistic armor penetration system or armor penetration simulation that I've ever seen in a strategy game of any kind. Here it shows that the developers of this game used to do tank simulators and, well, still do. Every hit on a tank is precisely calculated. Every shell type has its own unique properties. For every shell that impacts on armor, there will be complex calculations made to see if that shell will penetrate the armor or not. Will it maybe just bounce off? Will it maybe have such an impact that it doesn't penetrate, but the impact will cause spalling inside the tank that will then damage or kill the crew and damage systems inside. If it does penetrate and it's maybe a shell with a delayed fuse, will the fuse detonate inside the tank? Or did the fuse maybe break upon impact on the armor? All that is calculated and you can have a look after each battle at the after battle statistics. Have a look at each tank, each vehicle and see which hits it did receive, and if those hits did penetrate, what did they damage, what did they cause, did they bounce off, did the shell break, everything is in precise detail visible for you. It's something I've never seen in any other strategy game, and it's just amazing. No hit point systems for the vehicles, no HP bars, nothing like that. Pure brutal simulation, nothing else. Also vision devices like for example sights on tanks and optics, they are all modeled as well with their historical properties. So each tank will have different capabilities. Even that was modeled by the devs. I tell you, the amount of historical research that has gone into all this is simply astonishing. I don't know how they found the time to do that. You, you just see that this game, it's not just a product that they made. This is a passion project for them. And that also becomes evident if you have a look at the films and see what the developers write and how knowledgeable they are about things. And that's just something that deserves a lot of respect, I think. There's also another thing that is absolutely unique to this game. I have never seen something like this in maybe any game ever. The communication on the battlefield is actually simulated and modeled here as well. The soldiers within a squad will communicate with each other and share targeting information. They will give that information to their commanding officer, 
who will pass it on along the chain to his superior, etc., etc. But in order to do that, he has to have a connection. And how does he get that connection? Because not everybody has a radio, it's the Second World War. Well, either he's close enough to his superior so that they can communicate via voice, or he can use flares to communicate. You will see that a lot in this game. Units using flares to communicate, to signal in which direction the enemy is, to signal that they are attacking now, to signal all kinds of things. And then on top of that, there are special squads of units, of soldiers, that serve no other purpose but to lay telephone wires from commanders to their subordinates. So, if you do this right, you will have a whole communication network on the battlefield. And you need to have that to give all us effectively, because the communication system directly ties into your ability to give orders to units. That's where this whole thing comes together and really, really becomes complex. Because each order you give to a unit costs a certain amount of, let's call it points, order points. Those replenish over time and they replenish faster if you have a good communication coverage on the battlefield. If there is very bad communication to a unit, then giving orders to that unit will also be more expensive than giving orders to a unit that is near the uh, highest commander on the battlefield, for example. So depending on your game settings, you will actually have to be very careful with the orders you give. Because, as I said earlier, each order given costs points. You have 100 order points, they do replenish over time, but giving an attack order to a unit might cost 50 points if their communication to that unit is not good enough. Now half of your command points are gone with just one order given. And here you have what makes this game very, very different from any strategy game out there. This game will actively punish you if you try to micromanage. If you try to micromanage in this game, then the order system together with the communication system will punish you. You won't be able to give orders to your units. And if that happens at a critical moment, well, that's bad. <laughs> that's very bad then. Now, you're incentivized to actually give as little or as few orders as possible and just let your units do their thing. Don't try to micromanage too much. You can do some micromanaging, but don't overdo it. It depends on how well your communications are set up and, of course, on the settings in the uh, game settings that you have chosen. Also part of the whole communication system is um, artillery support. There's both on and off map artillery. On map artillery can be directed by a battery commander, for example, who is spotting targets. He has to relay those firing orders back to his battery somehow, preferably via a radio set if he has one, or via a cable connection, a telephone connection then the battery will be able to receive his orders and fire on the designated targets. Then, of course, there's also off-map artillery. Those are usually big guns. And you have certain units that are artillery spotters. They can designate fire zones for the artillery. And if they have a good vision of the area that needs to be bombarded, then the incoming artillery will arrive faster and be more accurate. If they do not have vision on the area. Artillery that comes in might take up to 10 minutes to start coming in and then until the shots are corrected it might take another few minutes. So you better make sure that your artillery observers have a good view of the target. That certainly helps to get artillery on target fast and accurately. And artillery can be a huge asset in these battles. Air support as well. If you have an air spotter nearby and there's air support in the area, he can designate targets for the planes and they will tear those targets up. It's amazing to watch. 
The game also comes with a quick battle function where you can play basically a randomly generated battle. It also comes with a battle editor where you can create the battle that you want to play. Now, I have done a lot of talking for the past half hour. Now I'll do some showing. We'll just go into the game and I'll show you some gameplay. So now we are in the game's main menu. Let me show you the things that you can access from here. Let's start with the encyclopedia. In the encyclopedia you can check out every vehicle that is available to you in the game. For example here we have a KV-1 and we can check for example all the sites that are available to the crew on this vehicle that they can use and that can also be destroyed during the battle. Don't forget that. We can compare the armor of the tank to all the weapons that are in the game. For example to this nice little seven and a half centimeter gun here. The same works in, uh, um, in reverse, so we can compare our KV-1's weapon to the armor of any other vehicle, for example a Panzer IV here. We can also check out the different camo patterns that are available for this vehicle. Here for example for desert environments. Then we can see the vehicle parameters which gives us a few more information about this vehicle. There's a scale that can be included here so that you might get a sense of how big this thing really is. And some vehicles have some additional information here where you can read up on the historic details even with sources quoted below. Now let's go back to the main menu. Then you have of course the controls. You have the game settings. These are important. One of the most important settings I believe is the tactical battle time. This can be set anywhere from half an hour to three hours. I like it uh, two hours because this gives both the AI and me enough time to maneuver to get into position and to launch attacks without being too long. Then we have quick battles, we have the tutorials that are available in the game, we have the battle editor, when you can set up any battle you would like to play, and we have the campaigns. The campaigns are either sorted by DLC or chronologically. So the first DLC that I own starts in 1941 and it goes all the way to 1943. And since I do own the um, Angolan War DLCs, I also get these 1987 campaigns here. Now let's return to the main campaign. Here on this screen, you can see that some campaigns are listed two times. Why is that? Well, if we go to this map really quick, we see these units on the battlefield and each of these units is one platoon basically. So this platoon here consists of seven squad with 29 uh, people in it. This is the old system, which is still in use for many of the campaigns. Gravity Team has introduced a new battle group system at some point which you can see here. It basically takes all those units and combines them into battle groups. So here, for example, we have a battle group consisting of 180 people organized in 33 squads. That's quite something, isn't it? This makes it easier to keep track of your forces during really big battles. And it also allows you to bring more troops at once into a battle. So, quite a good system, actually. Now let's return to the main menu. If you hover over one of the pictures, you will get a short description of the campaign. If you hover over the flag, you will see the turn duration. So each turn will take up four hours. Uh, the area of operation is 140 square kilometers, and you will see how the victory points are calculated. 
This campaign will last for 21 turns. So if each turn is 4 hours, you can imagine how many days this campaign covers. Let's in fact start it. Uh, I cannot select this. Okay, let's just start the operation. And this is how it looks. So we start out with the briefing. Here on the right side you have some historical information. This will also update during the campaign so that you can um, compare your own situation to the historical situation. What we see on the map right now is the historical situation at 8 o'clock on this day, on the 30th of July 1943. We can also see that it's raining. Air support might be available. We can take a look at the map without all those briefing markers. And this is actually the game's main map, 140 square kilometers big. So here we have our units. Also with a lot of reserves coming in later. The enemy units, yeah, they are here on the front everywhere. We do not know what they are yet. Once we have fought an enemy unit, we will gain more information on it. And if we manage to capture enemy soldiers, we will get even more reliable information. Now on this screen, this is the operational phase. This is completely turn-based. Here you can move your units, for example, this recon. We will move them to the front, like so. Here you can set up attacks. So let's say we will set up an attack, oh, I don't know, on this area here, why not? There you go. Here we can check out the units that we have. We can see if we, uh, where is it? Nope, wrong one. Yeah, here we can see which units belong together. So who is commanding who basically? It helps to keep units or to keep battle groups that are formed from the same um, platoons or for those from the same regiments. It helps to keep them together. That will help you with command in the battles. You can also check out the supply situation. For example, this HQ here is supplying all these units. And we have another HQ up here supplying those units. So you got to keep this in mind. Also, repair units. Which units can they reach? You can also check out each unit individually. For example, if I go in here, we can see that this unit here is made up of the 8th Heavy Tank Company command and the 8th Heavy Tank Company 1st Platoon. Here you can see how many men each platoon has. You can see their morale, their stamina, their experience, how well they are supplied with ammunition and fuel, and some other things. You can also set up reinforcement strategies. For example, let's take this unit that we uh, just looked at. And we can select to include the fifth tank company in this unit as well from the reserves. So here you can reinforce or swap out units that have been mauled by the enemy, bring in reserves, set up reinforcement strategies, all that can be done here. There's also an order of battle. So for example here we see we have units of the 6th army. We have for example Uh, these units, also some from the second um, TC, what does TC stand for? Oh, SS Das Reich, okay, we have those guys. SS Totenkopf. Okay, we are playing the baddies. So, that's what you can do here. And once you have set up all your units as you want them and move them into position and set up attacks, you can end your turn. And then the enemy's turn starts. 
Let's try that. Next turn. Let's see what happens. The enemy is now moving around. And since they are on the defensive, they didn't attack anywhere actually. So this attack that we started up here is what we will now play. This here will be our battlefield. These units will be included in the battle for us. And these two units will be included for the enemy. I expect a swift victory here. So let's start the battle. And there we are. So the battle is played in a few different phases, so to say. We are now in the deployment phase. The deployment phase allows us to set up our units where we want them to start the battle. We can also see on the map this is the battlefield. We can see our units here. We can see where the enemy can set up. They will set up somewhere in here. And right now we can just go ahead. Let's actually... Okay, these guys are here. They can stay there. I don't mind. What are you? You are Panzer Force. Look at those. Aren't they looking awesome? Yeah, we'll just more or less leave everything as it is. I could now move them around, set them up somewhere else. But this is just for demonstration purposes. We will not let this take too long. The video has been going on for quite some time. Thank you if you are still watching. <laughs> okay, let's leave everything as it is and advance to the next phase, I believe. Oh, although, let's do something else really quick. We do have some artillery and we can set up fire missions in advance of the battle. Pre-planned fire missions. For example, there's a nice tree line here. Let's set up a fire mission on that. Now, these are trees. Let's actually use incendiary rounds. And let's fire five per gun. That will be all 20 incendiary rounds that we have. The barrage will arrive in 1 minute and 11 seconds. Let's go. We have even more artillery batteries. 15 centimeter heavy infantry guns. Yeah, sure. Bring those as well. Those guys will just... Hmm. Where could the enemy be? Hard to tell. According to the map, they will set up just north of this tree line and in this tree line over here. So maybe we will do actually that. We will shell this area. We'll use the high explosive this time. Uh, set up. Okay, those are two guns. Five per gun. Sure, why not? Let's go. Just for demonstration purposes. Once you have set up all your units in the positions that you want to have them in, you can end this phase and finish the deployment. All your units will be deployed right now. And there we go. I expect to see enemy trenches. Oh yes, I do. They have trenches here. Okay, maybe I need another fire mission to get them out of there. Actually, can we... No, this is scheduled support, so I cannot call them in once the battle has started. Okay, never mind. This is all scheduled support. No, here we have... Ah, okay, here we have some 8 centimeter mortars that we can use. They are off map artillery in this case, but we can use those like so. That's a shitty accuracy. Uh, that is because my spotter actually does not have direct line of sight to this. We can check that. Yeah. This is what my spotter can see, and as you might notice, he cannot see very far. So that will not work very well. However, we have more than enough ammunition, and this is a demonstration after all. So let it rip. Okay, 
the initial orders phase. The initial orders phase allows me to give orders to units without um, expanding any command points. The command points are represented up here. So I have a command level of 100. I have 100 command points. And if I were to give orders to a unit, then in case of this unit here, this would cost me 15 command points. This is actually... Let's take a few more units. Let's maybe take this unit back here. So yeah, this would cost me something between 27 and 55 command points just to give one order. Now the command points are replenishing at a rate of 289 per minute, which is largely because of my um, communication organization here on the battlefield. All these tanks that I have, they all have radios. So I have very good communication set up by default, basically. And that helps. So I don't think I will run out of command points. Okay. Let's give a few initial orders anyway. Which will basically be um, to all my tanks, move towards the enemy and shoot at them a bunch. Wow, I have a lot of units on the battlefield. This is crazy. You guys, where are you? You um, attack here. You guys attack here. You guys... Oh yeah, you attack as well. You, where are you? You are there. You will actually do the following. You will move along the roads. And... Then you will attack in this direction. What are you? You will... Yeah, just drive across the field, just go for it. The order wheel here, let me talk briefly about that. So you see here are different orders that I can give to my units. What I can also do is modify those orders. For example, here I've set up the attack order will be executed um, from the units. They will march in a line in a normal formation, so not dense or sparse. And I can select some different things. For example, I can tell them here to go in one line or in three lines. I will leave it in three lines, I believe. Yeah, why not? Let's go. This is just really quick and dirty. Just get these units in. This is just for demonstration purposes. Nothing serious. We are just having a look here. Okay, that's about... Yeah, let's just go. Start the game. Now, every unit has some statistics here. We have this Panzer IV. Oh, this is not a Panzer IV. This is a Panzer VI. Yeah, a Tiger. And we can see it's intact. It has five people inside. We can see how much ammunition they have in detail. Smoke shells, fuel, their command level. They have a radio link. Combat sustainability, experience, everything can be viewed here. Here we have our support panel for artillery support. And here we have... Oh, we encountered some mines. Oh, that's bad. Um, you drove across a minefield, didn't you? You are still okay, though. Unit lost. You aren't. Okay. What happened to you? Panzer IV. Gunner, commander, loader, machine gunner. They were all disabled. Lights, ammo, track, chassis, fuel tanks. They were all damaged. And the radio, the transmission, and the gearbox were outright broken by the mines. Damn it. Okay. We will have an artillery strike coming down now. Ah, there's one back there. And yeah, there's one incoming here as well. Two artillery strikes. Oh, and the shell has started the fire apparently. That's fine. As you can see, the weather is absolutely terrible. Let me go to this tank really quick. Yeah, let me go to this one and I will show you the side sectors. So here you can see in action what the 
units inside the tank and see. The gunner is looking through his sights. No, now he's looking out to the side. The driver is looking through his little viewport here and the commander is not looking through the sights right now. Neither is the loader. They are sticking their heads out. Might not be a good idea. My frames are tanking a bit because the enemy is actually using artillery against us. However, this Panzer IV just shrugged it off and is going. Go little Panzer IV. I can also speed up the time. So that way you won't have to wait for so long. Damn it, the enemy is really shelling this position here. Thankfully nobody is there. Another artillery strike is coming. Those must be my mortars. The incendiaries are still landing in this tree line. And we do have enemy contact apparently. Oh yes, hi there. We drove straight across an enemy trench. And now this Panzer IV is a little bit stuck here. And the enemy infantry is actually throwing grenades at it. Yeah, same with this one. This one has actually a few Molotovs thrown at it. But they're still going and will return fire. There we go. Molotovs can actually be very effective against the tank. So one has to be careful here. The tanks are supporting each other though. Oh yeah, this thing is not looking too good. Something is broken. The engine is damaged actually. Possibly by the Molotovs. It's still going though. So, that is basically how battles work. I can now move my units around, I can execute attacks, I can get them into huge attack formations and keep them going towards the front. I can employ more off-map or on-map artillery. Maybe there might be air support coming in later, who knows. There's all kinds of things that can be going on. And... For now, I think we will end this battle. Let me actually... Usually you wouldn't do that, of course, but let me withdraw. That will start a timer up here of one minute, after which my units will basically retreat from the battlefield. Oh, I lost a tank here. Check that in a moment. There we go. Now I get the battle results. And here I can see my losses, I can see the enemy's losses. Now I only lost 5 men during the battle, killed 32. But I expect I will have some more losses on the operational map because I retreated from the battlefield. What I can also do is check out the battlefield and have a look at my tanks and see what they were hit with. So what caused this crew to jump out of their tank? They did have a grenade thrown at them. Let's see, damaged engine. Okay, the engine might have been knocked out by Molotovs. Yeah, that's probably what happened. Oh, these guys had a lot of stuff thrown at them and shot at them. Yeah, we can see that, but actually nothing penetrated and did any serious damage. For those of you who have watched my Steel Fury videos, you will be familiar with this stuff. And it's amazing that this strategy game offers you the option to do this. To check how your vehicle was destroyed or how an enemy vehicle was destroyed, who destroyed it and all that stuff. That's really, really great. For example, yeah, let's go back to this tank. And I know this guy did it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Okay. And here we see, yeah. I think I've been pushed out of these areas. Battle group routed, yeah. Because I retreated. So, now we would once again move our units. We can advance to the next turn here. There we go. And now we see the historical situation as it was at 12 o'clock during that day. We also get a little bit more um, background info on the historical situation down here. And there we go. Now we can all again move our units, set up attacks, etc. The whole things that we just did. And we are back in position. So, let's conclude this. Are Gravitim Tactics, Mio's Front and Tank Warfare Tunisia the best World War II strategy games? No, not really. But only because they do not follow the traditional rules of strategy games. They are, however, the best World War II battlefield simulators in existence. Period. Do I recommend these games? Absolutely. I will actually go ahead and put links in the video description to the Steam store pages so that you can check out the games for yourself and maybe you are interested in buying them and supporting the developers because these games are absolutely one of a kind. Also, you can look forward to me playing Gravity Team Tactics Mio's Front on this channel. I will be playing one of the smaller campaigns so that we can focus on the individual units better. I am certain it will be quite amazing and interesting. So make sure you actually subscribe to the channel to not miss that. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to watch this rather long video. And I really look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, have a great day and goodbye.